Good morning, all. Got to see a lot of, I think every, almost everybody here was at the conference. Outstanding conference. We were running on pregnancy time at the conference. So we, we, we got a total of like three and three quarters of the sermons. But the three and three quarters of the sermons that we got were outstanding and just powerful and convicting and huge blessing. Those sermons should be coming up online at some point. And so if you didn't get to hear them, highly, highly recommend it. So today, I would like to start off with some cultural background. Who has seen or heard of the He Gets Us commercial from the Super Bowl? So, looks like most of you have. Brief summary of the commercial that aired during the Super Bowl, which is prime time as far as commercials are concerned. These are like the cream of the crop commercials of the year are the Super Bowl commercials. Costs, I don't know, untold millions of dollars to get your commercial played during the Super Bowl. So these are the ads that have been planned and budgeted for, and all the major companies will sink a ton of money into getting their ad in during the Super Bowl because it's prime viewership. One of the ads that was run, and sounds like the most controversial ad that was run, was by the He Gets Us campaign. And the ad is about a minute long, and it had it consisted of a series of paintings, I think the digital paintings, of scenes of people washing other people's feet. There was a woman washing another woman's feet outside of an abortion clinic. There was a pastor of some sort washing a clearly homosexual man's feet. There was just a, a police officer washing a gangbanger's feet, an oil rig worker washing a environmental activist's feet. So a uh, whole collage of these foot washings that are, most of them were clearly politically charged. And then it concluded, and, and in the background is of course this heartfelt emotional music. And then it concluded with, I wrote down the quote. The quote was, Jesus didn't teach hate. He washed feet. He gets us. That's the backdrop for what I'm going to say. And before I move into it, I just want to quickly note the dichotomy that's already presented. So it's two quick notes. Number one, I don't have a problem with any of those pictures, if you understand it biblically. Should we wash the feet of the gay people around us? You bet. Should we wash the feet of the illegal immigrants? You bet. There should be no more loving and tolerant community than the Church of Jesus Christ, in one sense. You come here and you receive the love of Jesus. But the love of Jesus includes the truth. Amen. So wherever you're coming from, you are welcome here, but you are not welcome to come and treasure your sin. You're welcome to, be, to come and be freed from your sin. That's what Jesus does. Also note the false dichotomy. Jesus didn't teach hate. He washed feet. Well, no, Jesus taught hate and washed feet. That's right. You can do both, and we must do both. Did Jesus teach love? You bet. Did he teach hatred for sin? You bet. That's right. Now, there's your cultural backdrop. If I were going to title this, the title is, He Gets Us. That's the title. And the subtitle is, That Should Make Our Blood Run Cold. He gets us, and that should make us tremble. That should scare us to death. I want to begin by answering a question that I saw in response to one of my Facebook posts. The person asked, why are you so fire and brimstone with the Lord? Why do you do, do so much fire and brimstone talk? The answer is because God is fire and brimstone to those that rebel against his holiness. And it is not love to say nothing. It is not love to say peace, peace, when there is no peace. The phrase fire and brimstone 
comes from Genesis 19, 12 and 13, where God rained fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. Literal fire and literal brimstone poured out from heaven by a holy God. That is fire and brimstone. That was God's idea. That was not some preacher's idea that wanted to get converts. That was God's idea. He said, this is what I think of sin. And then he dropped an atom bomb on two wicked cities from heaven. I want to start off by reading 1 Kings 22. I'll get there eventually. 1 Kings 22, we have... Ahab and Jehoshaphat going to war. Jehoshaphat says, Is there not yet a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of him? And so they've got all these prophets that are coming in and prophesying. Uh, this is 1 Kings 22, 11. Then Zedekiah, the son of Chinaana, made horns of iron for himself and said, Thus says Yahweh, with these you will gore the Arameans until they are consumed. All the prophets were prophesying thus, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. Then the messenger who went to summon Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Behold, now the words of the prophets are uniformly favorable to the king. Micaiah, this is a good prophet. Please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak favorably. Be winsome, Micaiah! They're delivering good news. They're telling him that it's all going to work out. God is on his side. Just... Just go along with it. Don't be the fire and brimstone prophet that you usually are, Micaiah. Just come along quietly and say, oh yeah, God will give you the victory. But Micaiah said, as Yahweh lives, what Yahweh says to me, that I shall speak. When he came to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall we refrain? And he answered him, and I'm going to deliver the inflection that I envision based on the context in the text. I'm reading this into the text. But I see Micaiah's answer is something like this. Oh, oh, totally. Go up and succeed. Go for it. Yahweh will give it into the hand of the king. You bet. You're good to go. Then the king said to him, How many times must I adjure you to speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of Yahweh? So Micaiah said, I saw all, all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep which have no shepherd. And Yahweh said, These have no master. Let each of them return to his house in peace. Then the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? Micaiah said, He wasn't done. Therefore, hear the word of Yahweh. I saw Yahweh sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. Yahweh said, Who will entice Ahab to go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? That's a sovereign God. And he was done with Ahab. Micaiah describes how the, the prophets were going to be filled with deceiving spirits. And at the end, fateful words. The king of Israel says, Take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus says the king, Put this man in prison and feed him sparingly with bread and water until I return safely. And Micaiah says, Oh, oh I'm sorry. Did I hurt your feelings? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Please, don't. Don't persecute me. No. Micaiah says, if you indeed return safely, Yahweh has not spoken by me. And he said, listen, all you people. He said, pay attention. You see what's going on here? Okay, so there's our backdrop. We're called to be Micaiahs. We're not called to be these other, these other prophets who are speaking favorably to a people that is under the wrath of God. Jeremiah 8, 8 through 12. Don't have time to go there. There's another reference you can read about prophesying what is true versus what is pleasing. Jeremiah 8, 8 through 12. Ezekiel 33 is the watchman on the wall. And what does God say to the watchman on the wall? If you do your job and you see the judgment coming and you tell the people, their blood is not on your head. But if you do not speak, their blood is on your head. And the church in America, Joel Osteen, should shake when he reads that passage because he has millions of people that come to his church that should know 
that there is hell to pay. Literal hell to pay if we do not repent. So we must fear God. And I want to focus on this in two particular ways. We must fear God first personally and then politically. Proverbs 9.10, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Isaiah 66.2. Remember Isaiah 66.2. I think this is probably my favorite scripture verse when it comes to the fear of the Lord. Isaiah 66.2. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. So before we get to the political applications and to all the things out there that those people need to do, do I tremble at the word of God? Do you tremble at the word of God? When we read this book, do we feel the threshold shaking? Do we realize that this is the Holy One speaking to us? This should be, I want this to be a description of me. Humble, contrite of spirit, trembling, At the word of God. So number one, personal. We're going to look at personal and then political. Number one, personal. Fearing God on a personal level. Do we fear God? Do we believe what he says about our sin? Do we recognize the majesty and the miracle of our salvation? Firstly, hell is real. Hell is real. Do we understand that? Do you get that? Have you meditated on that lately? That's, that is a truth that I find myself getting dead to. And even questioning sometimes. Like, isn't that kind of harsh? Is, is, it, is it really hell? Really? Yeah, hell. Really. That's what God says. That's what the Bible says. You can look it right up in Revelation 20, 14 and 15, where there are two camps specified. Those in the book of life and those in the lake of fire. Those are your choices. Hell is real. Do we tremble? Do we have an evangelistic fervor that reflects the fact that hell is real and that, yes, I am saved and my neighbor is standing on the brink of eternal damnation? What does the love of God enjoin me to do? So we should examine ourselves, first of all, with the blood earnest seriousness of the eternal consequences of whether or not we are truly in the faith. So that when we cross that threshold into eternity, we're on the right side of that judgment seat. Number two, chastening is heavy. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, this he shall also reap. Even for the believer, in some ways especially for the believer, your loving father will not let you get away with sin. So if you are comfortable with sin, you should tremble. You should be scared. Because either God is going to discipline you or he doesn't love you and you're not actually his child, which is even worse. God will not be mocked. So brothers and sisters, let us watch ourselves. These sins that we get comfortable with, that we feel like are not that big of a deal, they're a big deal. They're a really big deal. I was convicted of this over the weekend. I was thinking about Sin, my sin, and how easy it is for me to think to be, to be the Pharisee who thinks I'm a, I'm a pretty good guy. I mean, I was raised right and I didn't do all the things that all the people do out there and, you know, monogamous marriage and all this wonderful stuff, courtship and homeschooling and the whole nine yards. And then I realized, what does Jesus say? What does scripture say about responsibility when you've been given much? It says, to whom much is given, much is required. And I was thinking about that and realizing, you know what? In the eyes of God, which is worse? The transgender person out there who is floundering, trying to find identity and satisfaction. And they don't, they, they're just lost as a goose in a snowstorm. They have no idea what's going on. Or me, who spends three hours mad at my wife. And I full well know that that is not what God expects of me. That is not what Jesus died to pay for. For me to just be comfortable in my sin. Which is worse? It may well be me in the eyes of God. It may well be my sin because I know full well when I snap at my kids, when I stress out over my work, 
That, that person out there who's got anxiety and attacks doesn't know that Jesus says, do not worry, I care for the birds, I will care for you. But I do know that. To whom much is given, much is required. So we must watch ourselves and not make room for sin. Next, grace is glorious, Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So what I am not saying is that if we were really righteous, we would just live under a burden of guilt all the time and feel like, oh, I'm just a terrible, terrible sinner. I'm a bad, bad person. Amen. Well, yes, we are terrible sinners and we are bad people. But we have a great Savior and his grace is glorious. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We should rejoice. But, next, po- next point, love is reflective. Brought out over the weekend. Outstanding. The, the sinner woman washes Jesus' feet and Jesus says, he who's been forgiven much, loves much. If we don't understand how much we've been forgiven, if we think we're pretty good, then what kind of love will we have for Christ? And what kind of love will we have motivating our obedience? A cold and lukewarm and apathetic one. Because, yeah, he forgave me some stuff, but, I mean, why wouldn't he? I'm a pretty good guy. That, that's, not, <laughs> that's not the heart of the Christian. That's not the gospel. And that is not a love that's going to empower us to obey Christ from an overflowing heart of love until we see ourselves as, like Kevin Swanson was saying, as the woman, the sinner woman. We're not going to weep over the feet of Jesus. We're not going to overflow with love and good works for him because we don't get it. We don't get it. We're the Pharisee instead. So hell is real. Chastening is heavy. Grace is glorious. Love is reflective. Evangelism is necessary. If we're going to love God, we will love our neighbor also. That love of Christ should overflow in preaching the gospel. I'm convicted. Convicted of how many neighbors do I have that I've talked to about Christ? Why not? If I haven't, why not? The only reason why not would be because it's uncomfortable. That's a really, really, really bad reason. If I really believe what the Bible says about eternal judgment, again, this is not like a guilt trip of you better get out there and evangelize an hour a day or you're a bad Christian. That's not the point. The point is, you know people that you have not talked to about Jesus. I know you do. Because I do. And the question is why? Don't be the watchman on the wall who didn't say anything. As you are going, preach the good news. Let us be faithful. And you know what? If they're going to be annoyed by the gospel, so be it. But let it not be that I did not love them enough to annoy them with what is true. I'm going to close out the personal section real quick reading this and then move into the political section. So the closing thoughts on the personal section. Do we get him? Okay, we say he gets us. Do we get him? He does get us, and that should scare us to death because hell is real, because his fatherly chastening is heavy. We should fear God. We should walk in the new nature that Christ has put into us. We should love as we have been loved. And we won't understand that until we understand how much we've been forgiven. So it starts there. Before we get to them out there, it starts with us, personally, fearing God, walking in holiness, trembling before the word of God, because he gets us. And that should make our blood run cold until we see our sin as he sees it and see the blood of Christ as he sees it. And then we delight in the gospel grace that says we are no longer under condemnation. Now, the political application. Isaiah chapter 1, 10 through 17. Hear the word of Yahweh, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says Yahweh? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. 
Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. God judges his people for not being politically involved. That's what that just said. God said, I do not want you to come to church. Because the rest of the time you are doing nothing about the wickedness that rises before me as a constant stench and you don't care. So you may as well make your Sunday match the rest of your week and stay home and watch football. God judges his people for not being politically involved because God is concerned about justice. God is concerned about the ruthless being reproved and the orphan being defended and the widow being pled for. God is concerned about the immigrant. Actual justice for the immigrant. Which means wicked immigrants who are doing wicked things face justice. And people who legitimately just want to immigrate for a better life can also justly have a lawful way to get in and be taken care of. God cares about justice, and his people should too. The judgment of God, I want you to meditate with me on this for a second, because this hit me heavy this last week. The judgment of God is not cute, and it's not academic, and it's not inconvenient. I don't know about you, but I have this kind of idea that when God judges a nation, it's kind of like, yeah, there's some wickedness, and a couple Christians get thrown in jail, and, you know, we're under the judgment of God right now. And, yeah, it's kind of inconvenient and not fun. We don't get it. I was – I listened to – I highly recommend the King's Hall podcast. They're walking through old Christendom, the last thousand years of Christian history, and the judgments that God brought against his rebellious people. And we're talking about, like, Islam, slaughtering Christians, doing unspeakable things to their victims – we're talking about the Vikings raiding and raping and pillaging and plundering. The judgment of God is not something that we just kind of are a little bit disappointed by. God brings nations to their knees. The tears are real. The blood is real. The devastation is real. It's the kind of stuff that you read in the history books and you shudder. That is the judgment of God. Isaiah 5, 24 to 30 talks about that. Now it will come about that instead of sweet perfume, there will be putrefaction. Instead of a belt, a rope. Instead of well-set hair, a plucked-out scalp. Instead of fine clothes, the donning of sackcloth and branding instead of beauty. Your men will fall by the sword and your mighty ones in battle. And her gates will lament and mourn and deserted. She will sit on the ground. God does not change. He still does this. And if we think that we are under the judgment of God right now, we are. But we have seen nothing yet. God's metric for true religion is not emotional song services. We've got those. We've got plenty of those in America. It's not Bible studies. We've got plenty of those too. It's not even conferences. That's not his metric for true religion that he gives us in what we just read. Are those things bad? Of course not. Matthew 23, 23. These things you should have done without neglecting the others. You should still do your conferences. You should still sing with genuine emotion to the Lord. But if that's where it stops... God says, go home. Don't waste your time. Don't waste my time. He wants worship with teeth. Worship with muscle. Worship with hands. Worship with blood and sweat and tears. We will bleed. The question is whether we bleed in worship now and tremble before the word of God or whether we bleed under judgment and tremble under his wrath. And just because we as individuals have been saved from the wrath of God, amen, we have, glory, hallelujah, does not change the fact that we stand in a nation that is on the brink of absolute abject terror. And the last thing we need is more conservative politics. 
So, does our worship have teeth? Does my worship have teeth? Somebody commented and said, you're, you, you're fire and brimstoney, but I have hope that God's going to turn this nation around. I, I have hope too. I hope he does. I pray that he does. But what does that look like? It looks like Nineveh. It looks like a prophet comes in and says, God is going to burn this place down. And then what does Nineveh do? Lord have mercy. Sackcloth and ashes. Nobody eat anything. Don't even let your animals eat anything. Maybe God will have mercy on our city. Then we'll, then we'll have hope. When we're crying out with literal tears for the millions of babies we've murdered, then maybe we'll have hope. For the, the, the girls that will never grow up to have babies because some doctor said, this will make you happy, 12-year-old girl. You're going to be happy. Let me destroy you. When we weep over that as a nation, then maybe we'll have hope. When we weep over worshiping the government, looking to the federal government as our savior instead of the one true God, then maybe we'll have hope. Until then, I have hope that God is just and that he keeps his word and that he will not be mocked. And I hope in that and I glory in that because he is good and he is faithful and I tremble. And we should all tremble. We have no right to presume that God is going to do something different than he always has done and then his word says he will do. So if we really have hope, if we really want to see that, then we should be doing more of Jonah and less of the false prophets crying peace, peace, when there is no peace. So in conclusion, we need to brace ourselves because judgment is coming. The kind of judgment that makes us shiver when we read the history books. God is not impressed with worship and injustice. If we look around, what do we see? Is the broad Christian culture of America concerned with actual justice? With abortion, genital mutilation, theft, whether it's legal or illegal, everything from Black Lives Matter riots, what is that? It's theft. Or taxation, theft, and redistribution, do we care? That's theft. Does God care about theft? Does God care about justice? Unequal weights and measures in elections and prosecutions. Partiality and ethnic vainglory. Is racism a problem? You bet it's a problem. But there's only certain, certain kinds of racism that we're allowed to talk about. Well, the Christian church should be concerned about all kinds of ethnic vainglory, as Doug Wilson says and says, well, it's biblical terminology. Cultural Marxism is another form of the same thing the church should be concerned about. Disregard for basic gendered piety as commanded by God's word. Basic gender roles. Wives submit. Husbands lead. Men protect. Does that concern us? Actual justice for and against illegal immigrants? The list could go on and on. But the question is, do we, do the people of God care or are our hands covered with blood? The American church makes a great show of caring about whatever social issues are in vogue. That is not the same thing as rebuking the ruthless. There are some faithful men and women out there. Praise God for that. This is not the, the Elijah complex of, oh, we're the only ones. No, we're not the only ones. Praise God for that. But the fact that the broad face of American Christianity is one that looks on the culture around with a placid smile, calmly cooing that he gets us, should send shivers down our spine. And that leads me to the personal question before I come down on all of them out there. Have I taken the log out of my own eye? When was the last time that I missed a meal because babies are getting torn apart legally in my country? When was the last time that I shed a tear for the iniquity of Sodom? When was the last time that some perversion on the screen was enough for me to actually just get up and walk out? Do we take this stuff seriously? God does. Do I? When was the last time that some high-handed insult to the Holy One made me feel physically sick? I want that kind of holiness in my heart. 1 Peter 2.8 talks about Lot and says that that righteous man's soul was tormented every day by the sin he saw around him. Is my soul in torment or am I just used to it? I want that righteousness of soul that is tormented by the wickedness in my nation that causes me to cry out to God. 
Yes, there is only so much that one of us can do, but are we doing our part? Let us not be worshipers with bloody hands. Let us not become comfortable in thinking that the problem is just with them out there. Let us make sure that we tremble before the word of God. Not a guilt trip to say that we don't do enough, but rather a reminder that we must be faithful. We must have hearts that are sensitive to God's word. We must have kingdom priorities and we must be shaken out of our complacency and realize that our neighbors are teetering on the precipice of eternal damnation and our nation is staring at a tsunami of boiling wrath. We need to look into the eyes of the next generation and realize that their blood will be on our hands if we are not faithful to be that watchman on the wall. Real blood will be shed in real streets and real innocent people will be torn apart by real demons unless we repent. Yes, he gets us. He gets our wickedness. He gets our rebellion. He gets our hatred for him, for babies, for children, for outsiders, for poor people, for the innocent. He gets all of that. He gets our love of pornography, our insatiable hunger for sexual novelties and perversions, our dead consciences that don't raise an eyebrow when we drink sin for entertainment and walk by lawlessness like the robbed man laying in the street. He gets all of that and he will not be mocked. His justice will not sleep forever. The problem is not whether or not he gets us, but whether or not we get him. We can repent now and cry out to him with prayer and fasting, and maybe, just maybe, he will turn from the wrath that is already brimming over the cup of heaven. Or we will get him. We will get his holiness. We will get his anger against sin. We will get the inevitable nature of his law. We will get what we have coming, what we have asked for, what we deserve. The blood of the babies will be answered for. The shredded families and the surgically mutilated bodies and the theft and the lies, the proud and rebellious women, the cruel and apathetic men, the crooked judges and everybody who sat idly by and watched it all happen. We still think that we are the greatest nation on earth. We forget that God has shattered the greatest nations on earth at the height of their arrogant hubris and has done so using barbarians. He does not need America. We desperately need his mercy. No amount of conservative political victory can save this nation from the coming wrath of God. We will kiss the sun or we will perish.